And now we want to see the help of the Holy Spirit. How can the Holy Spirit help us? Praise the name of the Lord. Um, sometimes you need to help people to believe. I believe, in fact, I've been to, uh, I've, my years in New Zealand is getting to seven years now. I've seen men on the pulpit. Fortunately, it's not having a church that is pastoring. But I see him carrying more grace than some people that are pastoring churches. In fact, apart from the will of God in his life, apart from the will of God in his life, I don't believe he should get out of New Zealand. I believe New Zealand is him. It's like New Zealand is, New Zealand frustrate, gifted, is gifted men. New Zealand don't celebrate their gifted spiritual giants. So they drift out of the country for where ministry opportunities are. No, I'm not saying you don't go. You get me right. If God wants him to go, I want him to go. But I keep seeing that God needs him wherever he wants to use him. But it's one gifted man that I believe God needs in New Zealand. It's one gifted man, like I told people on Sunday, prays like a Nigerian. We, we like to pray loud and we then get tired. I've prayed with him for several times and I've tested his spirit in the place of prayer. He doesn't get tired. One day we went hunting and we prayed for maybe three or four hours and we forgot to go out. <laughs> and it wasn't the prayer of we were praying with strength. That all the demons on the hills came visiting us the following time. We went there. <laughs> the following time we went to that hill, they came around. So they woke him on force. <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. So join me this morning as I bring to the podium, uh, to the pulpit, Cyrus Williams' ministry. Amen. Celebrate his life, please. Wonderful. I am humbled um, by those words and um, to be able to represent such a great king. Um, it's an honor to speak for some, or to speak for a name that there is no other name higher than it. And um, I take that seriously because actually I carry the weight to a degree of that. And, um, and it always challenges me to, to constantly sharpen my, my pencil, as it were, to, to, to prove in the Word of God um, to myself, to go and study the Word, to make sure that what I'm bringing is, is there. And so, um, yeah, I just trust that you come hungry. I'm going to open, and, and um, well, I want to open, but I'm going to just... Just to clear some things in the spiritual realm and then, and then go from there. And yeah, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, I just take authority over the spiritual realm even now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, according to the grace that rests upon him. I bind everything that's contrary to the will and lordship of Jesus Christ. I take authority over it by the blood of Christ and I declare we have an open heaven here. And we have an advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous. And uh, that he makes intercession for us. He lives forever to make intercession for them. And so I just declare that. And I just declare that uh, your words be spirit and they will be life. And speak right to the spirit and to the heart of where uh, your people are at today. Each person comes with their own need and their own uh, uncertainties. And God, I ask that you would speak right under the core of that today. And that you would take my five loaves and two fish and you would feed, you would break the bread and you would feed the multitude. I welcome you doing this, and uh, as I open wide my mouth to speak, you'd fill it in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you. So, um, in uh, John 4, it talks about the woman at the well, and the woman at the well um, ends up just superseding or bypassing a whole lot of heartache um, of trying to find out who Jesus is. And so, in John 14, uh, sorry, John 4, um, it gives us a lovely little picture, and I'm just going to open up and start with this. Um, <clears throat> see, let's just give it a bit of context. The disciples have been walking with Jesus for essentially three, three and a half years. And it was near the, right near the end, they finally work out who he is. And, and Peter says, you're the Christ, you're the Son of the living God. And he says, upon, and Jesus said, upon this revelation, I'll build my church. And that revelation... It ends up taking a person that's been journeying with Jesus very intently. He's left his nets, 
He said, Jesus said, come follow me. And he goes out to follow. And so he's very intent to find out what it is to, to become a disciple and, and follow. But notice this. I'm going to read this from John chapter 4. Um, verse 24. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And the woman said unto him, I know the Messiah comes, which is the Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto you am he. Did Jesus hear that? That's why we. Hang on a minute. The disciples have taken three, three and a half years to get Jesus to to the point where he shears, and they've caught on that he's the Christ. And this lady, in one encounter, just gets it plainly, like straight, clear, the one that speaks unto you and he. Now, this is the question. What was the difference? These guys are already followed, they're going to come follow him. But how does this lady get such favor and such revelation in a short space of time? Basically, because Jesus wanted to make himself known to her by telling her about her husband. Yeah. And what did he hear? What did he find in, in, in this lady? Well, he found she was honest. She yeah. said, truly, mm -hmm. this man knows who I am. When somebody tells you something that they couldn't possibly know, rather be from God or a demonic statement, yeah, so uh, proved to her that he was Messiah and actually stated it later on in that account. He said that is I whom you are speaking to. Yeah. I'll sum it up a little bit here more clearly. Okay. At the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, it starts out, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. He reiterates it in another another verse or another another declaration, and he says Blessed are those who are hunger and thirst after in righteousness, they will be filled. If you're coming hungry today, you can supersede what's taken others a long time, even though they've followed closely. Mm -hmm. The hungry will be filled. Mm -hmm. It's a declaration that he says, if you come hungry, you can't not go away the same. You know, you will go away changed. Mm -hmm. And in the process of that, this lady's hungry, she's desperate. She's already stuffed up everything that she's already put a hand to, and she's the only one thing she has left is when Messiah comes, that he will fix all the problems, because I can't fix it, I've stuffed them up. And so she's desperate, she's hungry. And in that hungry, she's willing to leave the, the very thing, she, the, the other purpose that she came to, she leaves it behind, and she leaves the water pot behind, and she runs off, she heads off down to the village and says, is this not the Christ? Mm. And she ends up turning the whole village around, which means she, she grabbed it. Mm. It wasn't just, okay, you're the Christ. Because it's like, you are the Christ. Because hungry means you will be fed. Mm. Okay, let me start with that. Okay, I trust that you can find the place of hunger that God would feed you beyond what you anticipated you were coming for. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> In, uh, in 1 Corinthians verse 1, it shares <clears throat> some really interesting um, things here. So I'll start with this. 1 Corinthians, oh sorry, 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians 2 from, I'm going to read from 9. And it says, it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man what God has promised to those that love him. Mm. Now you've all heard that. I'm sure you've heard that. And it's mentioned three times in Scripture in different different passages and different books. Now that <clears throat> that declaration there, where your eye hasn't seen, in other words, God is everything you've always wanted, you never knew. It's everything that you've dreamed about but you haven't really articulated or, or realized. And in fact, it's even more than that. It's beyond what you dreamed. Okay. Now our topic today is the Holy Spirit, our helper. Let me read on. But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. Now notice is that, that now you can't enter into this verse unless you've got the Spirit. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. You follow me? 
So that tells us that actually if you want to see exceedingly abundantly above the things you could ask or think, mm -hmm. we need to go to the Holy part Spirit. with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. It's not going to come out of the flesh. Mm -hmm. Jesus said the flesh profits nothing, mm -hmm. but the Spirit is profitable unto all things. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> but God has revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man, save the Spirit of the man, which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now notice here, verse 12. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, good news, but the Spirit which is of God, that we may know the things that we've been freely given to us of God, that have been freely given to us of God. Now, this is where things get exciting. The Holy Spirit doesn't treat you according to what you deserve. He treats you according to your worthiness. Now, interestingly, your worthiness didn't come from you. My worthiness didn't come from me. My deserving comes from me, but my worthiness comes from him, from Jesus Christ. He was 100% punished, paid everything that I justly deserve to pay, and then says, so in the process of the talking the other, the other night, that God is not looking for a changed life, he's looking for an exchanged life. And so my life and who I am, Cyrus John Williams, here in this state, as it were, is uh, <clears throat> in the bracket of what I deserve. Mm -hmm. But in this bracket here, it's no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives within me. Mm -hmm. This life here is not what I deserve, it's, who I, it's my, according to my worthiness. Mm -hmm. Now why worthiness didn't come from me? And a gift is not given on the merit of the one who receives, but on the one who gives. That means is that it's not, wow, we, I was good enough to receive a gift. It was, wow, we, look at the one who gave. Wow, that's, he's amazing. How did he ever dream up that I would receive at his hand? And so God's not looking for you what you've done. In fact, love is a one-way street. And the, what it really means is this, is that the, the moment love is end up expecting something back, it's no longer love. Mm. And that's why a number of marriages are not working. Mm. Because you're loving with an expectation, and that's not love. Mm. Love is a one-way street. If you ever read, you know, notice in 1 Corinthians 13, and it says, you know, you probably heard it at every marriage, you know, 1 Corinthians 13, it says, it bears all things, believes all things, and hopes all things, and endures all things, love never fails. And it goes on, you know, it doesn't boast itself, doesn't seem itself unseemly, puffs it's not itself up. Born to know itself. So it says all these things, and at what point was love going the other direction? It just wasn't. It was just going this way. It was just solely going this direction. It was a one way street. And so, in the process of this, this is really foundational, and I'll share, I'll share why. It's because the moment we move from love, we move from partnership with the Holy Spirit. Okay. 1 Corinthians, sorry, Galatians. Galatians chapter... Come on, thank Jesus. Probably someone might even know the reference directly off the cuff, and it says that faith works by love. Okay, it's Galatians 5, 5 verse 6. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything or uncircumcision. In other words, it doesn't really matter if you're following the law or not. Okay, but faith works by love. And that means because love is the fulfillment of the law. If you want your faith to work, it must be in love. And if it's not in love, e.g. it's got expectations in there. If it's not in love, then faith doesn't work. And then you can't partner with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Because our partner with the Holy Spirit is faith. Anything, the currency which heaven transacts in is, is not in American dollars and it's not in, 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 in New Zealand dollars and it's not in, in rupees, you know, the Indian rupee. It's in faith. Faith is the currency whereby we transact in the heavens. Mm -hmm. Okay, you cannot, Paul says, the word profited in them nothing from Hebrews 4. The word profited them nothing, not being mixed with faith. Mm. 
But to get faith to work, it must be in love, must be on the one-way street. Mm. And that means the motive's right. When the motive's right, God says, I'll partner with that. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> what time do we want to aim for, um, Charles? Because we start a little bit later, or we just hit him for a few minutes' time? Yeah. What time are we going to finish? No, we can start doing it. Uh, five, 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 five. Are we finishing the original time or are we finishing the original time? Oh, no, I uh, don't understand. Because we started late. Like, just oh, yeah. minutes. Take your full time. Okay. <clears throat> okay. I'm going to turn to now John. Let's have a quick look. Uh, Okay, I have to do it by quick. Okay, so <coughs> I think this is in Matthew, and it says about. <coughs> Our needs must go. They'll send the comfort and fix us from John. Yeah. Okay. okay. It says, I need to must go that I send the Holy or the comfort to you. If I don't go, the comfort won't come. And he says on in, in Luke eleven eleven, it says you being evil know how to give good gifts. How much more will the Holy Spirit, now how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? What it's saying is this. Jesus was an awfully good gift. But He's saying, I've got to go because I've got a better gift coming. And if I don't go, then you can't receive the better gift that the Father wants to give to His sons that ask, His daughters that ask. That tells us that the Holy Spirit is actually whoa we right up there. That Jesus has a very, very high respect for the Holy Spirit. And now, picture this. In the Old Covenant, a spirit, the Holy Spirit would come on a man for a season, for a time. He would end up prophesying like Saul. He'd end up prophesying for a, for a time, and then the Spirit left him. And he was grieved with the, with the evil spirit. David prays. He says, oh, in, 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 um, in Psalms 51, he says, don't take your spirit from me. Okay? Because that was the old covenant. There was no reassurance that the Spirit would stay and remain. Mm. But when Jesus was baptized, the Spirit came and remained upon him. Mm. Then he says, I've got to go, because if I don't go, then I can't send the Holy Spirit, the Paracletus, your helper. The, um, <clears throat> I can't send him, and if he doesn't come, then he won't be able to rest on you. Mm. Now, when Then he goes on to say, when the Holy Spirit comes, He will remain upon you. He will rest upon you and dwell in you forever. Okay, And He will teach you all things and bring all things into your remembrance of all that I have shown or declared unto you. Okay. <clears throat> Nevertheless, I tell you, this is from John 16, thanks, 7. <clears throat> Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. And if I go not away, the Comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Okay? And then he goes on to say what some of the job things he'll do. From John chapter 14, and it says, Truly, truly, John chapter 14, verse 12. Truly, truly, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to the Father. Did you just catch that? That is a statement to say, your eye hasn't seen, your ear hasn't heard, you haven't even read it in the book. Because greater works are you going to do, because he's gone to the Father, and he sent you the Holy Spirit. And the more partnership you have with the Holy Spirit, greater works are going to happen. Okay? He's your helper. 
Verse 16, And I pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Notice that? It's not just coming on for a season. It's coming to remain. It rested upon, upon Jesus, and Jesus was the first fruits among many brethren. The first fruits of what it was looking like for a person to live undiluted in the baptism or in the being submerged in the Holy Spirit. The word baptism means submerged. The person that is submerged in the Holy Spirit, the Spirit rests upon them and remains. Abide with you forever. Verse 17. Even the Spirit of the truth whom the world cannot perceive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. Therefore, I no longer leave you comfortless, some of the scriptures say, as orphans, because I will come to you. That's wonderful. Okay, so let's, have, um, <clears throat> let's see a little bit about what the Holy Spirit is bringing. And if we turn to 1 Corinthians 12, it tells us some of the gifts of the Spirit. Now, as we're turning there from 1 Corinthians 12, the, there's gifts of Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, and there's <coughs> fruits of the Spirit. Now, some of you may have already picked up or heard that <clears throat> gifts are given and fruit are earned. Mm. Okay? Growing. Fruit is growing. That's a bit of a word, bit of a word. So, who knows that gifts are great because actually you can, you can receive an inheritance and then, what, voila, like, oh, I'm just in a house, I never had to earn it, I never had to work hard for it, it didn't take me a lifetime of trying to work it off. But just, boom. Thanks, Dad. It's a great inheritance. See, gifts are, gifts are wonderful because they just leapfrog us so much further ahead than trying to work it all off. Okay? And then fruit is growing. It's like, oh, okay, yep. Patient. Be patient. That's right. He's, he's still immature, but I used to be like that too, so I'll just give him some more grace. Okay? And that's a little bit slower, a little bit harder, isn't it? <laughs> Who knows? You can't read um, about patience and then you're just patient. Actually, you have to grow that limb, and it does feel like it's a little bit of pruning going on, and it's hard work. Okay? But we get there. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 8, and it says, <clears throat> uh, we'll go back to verse 6, 4, 3. Therefore I, give unto you, um, therefore I give to you understanding that no man speaking in the Spirit of God called Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Now there are diversities of gifts but the same Spirit, and there are di differences of administration but the same Lord, and there are diversities of operation but the same God which worketh all in all. Verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to everyone to profit with all. Notice this, everyone. It means that's available for you. That's great. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge, by the same Spirit, to another faith, by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing, by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another the different kinds of tongues. There's four different types of tongues. And to another interpretation of tongues, but all these workings, <clears throat> but all these worketh that one and the self same Spirit, dividing to every man several as he will. Okay, notice every man. That means is that that counts you and and you woman. Okay, to as God desires or wills. Now, have you noticed that in different people's lives, they just seem to keep getting more? You know what I mean? So it's just like. <clears throat> That person ends up, he ends up prophesying well, he ends up words of knowledge, he ends up healing, and he ends up all these different gifts, okay? And you think, man, well, why doesn't God just divide them out a little more, a little more evenly, you know, like that all the body of Christ is active? Well, that comes back down to the woman at the well. It says, um, and, about, and about the faithful steward, the prayer of all the faithful faithful steward, to him who has shall be given, and to him he has not, even that which he has, so don't be taken from him. In other words, you've got to use it, and you've got to have faith to believe that God wants to give you more, and in the process of that, as you come hungry, it's like, oh my gosh, Jesus just turned up. And uh, I love that. I, sometimes as I'm talking, people will get healed, or different things take place, and it's like, well, I, I just clearly know I didn't do that. You know what I mean? 
But God showed up. Because I came with an anticipation of God. Now notice this here from verse um, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 31. They covered earnestly the best gifts. That's a strong word. Covered is a very, very strong word. And there's some things you can cover and some things you can't. You can cover presence with the Holy Spirit. He's happy with that. In fact, he says he yearns jealously for you. That's also a pretty strong word. Okay. And he's able to... There's only... Here's a little piece on Why can God be jealous and we're told we're not allowed to be jealous? Okay. It's just simple as this. God can be jealous because he already owns it. And we can't be jealous because it doesn't belong to us. So, if you want to know what's a healthy jealousy and what's an unhealthy jealousy, it must belong to you. If it's your wife, yeah, you can be jealous to her. If it's if it's not if it doesn't if it doesn't belong to you, then it's an unhealthy jealousy. Okay, and yet and yet I show you a more excellent way. Now, all of one Corinthians thirteen tells us about love, and notice that. On the other side is chapter 14, and it says, Following after charity desire spiritual gifts. Okay, I'm going to bring this to the forefront here. You've got nine, nine gifts of the Spirit. They're just saying that. You've got nine gifts of the Spirit, and we've got nine fruits of the Spirit. The dove, the dove has nine feathers on one side, and nine feathers on the other. The Holy Spirit is the picture of the dove, and has nine spiritual gifts, and nine spiritual fruits. Interesting. Now, <clears throat> notice this, and it says, following after charity. In other words, all the gifts, gifts are given because you're loved. Okay, we don't give gifts to people that don't love them. <laughs> gifts are given, so God loves you and he gives gifts. And then this passage of 1 Corinthians 12 and then 1 Corinthians 14 is sandwiched. In the, in the middle of it is sandwiched love, a chapter on love. And if you can walk in this place of love and stewarding your heart in love, then the gifts on either side will begin to flow in your life. And so really the, the crux of it is, is this. To partner with the Holy Spirit is one to have faith, but it's faith out of the right motive. And the right motivation is love. And from that place, we end up walking in the Spirit. I think that's probably my time and might just need to round there. Yeah. Okay. Because I think I can squeak a smidge a smid more time. Okay, let's give it, I'm going to give it a picture of tongues. Okay. We'll just go as far as, as far as we can go. So, why does God give tongues? He says in 1 Corinthians 12, for the edifying, uh, um, he that speaks in an unknown tongue doesn't talk unto men but unto God. To the edifying of himself. Now, who knows this? That you people go, oh, that's so selfish. That's so sick. Why would he just want to edify himself? The thing is, is if you're not being built up from God, then you've got nothing to give. You're giving out of an empty tank, and who knows is that it doesn't take long before people don't drink from that cup. You're in its empty, you know, they don't come to you. They don't come because you've got nothing. And so we edify ourselves in tongues, and therefore we can flow. It says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. That edification comes by partnering with tongues. Now, see, here's the question. Why does God give tongues? Okay, and a simple word picture is this. Imagine you've got a doctor. He's, uh, he's been stewarding, you know, in medicine and practice for, for um, say, 60 years. or 40 years. He's maybe in the 60th year. So he's been stewarding for <clears throat> basically 40 years of medical practices. And then his grandson turns up. And he ends up having a conversation with his grandson, which is four years old. Now, he has one of two choices. In the natural, he basically has one choice. Okay, well, he has two or two choices. He can try and tell his grandson how the, how the body works and, and things, and using <clears throat> culinary... He might just say, um, this, you know, this person's got pleurisy, and um, da, 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 da. Now, pleurisy is to do with your lungs, and it's, um, it's an infection and things now. So he'd have to explain that to his grandson. Now, the other alternative is he gets down to the grandson's level and he says, you know, um, <coughs> lungs, that's quite amazing. They're like the sacs inside that breathe, and you can get air in and out. Okay. 
But God says either of those two don't really work. When God talks big language, we don't get it. And when God talks small language, he can't really say what he wants to say. Mm. And so what he does is he gives us tongues. And then he says, instead of me talking down at your level, or you trying to understand my level, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some software. And I'm going to put into you, so you can now converse with me at my level. And you can understand, and we're going to transact spiritual things, because you're going to be discerned on the spirit realm. And who knows, when you speak in tongues, you may not understand with your mind, and then later on go, I get it. Something, I just received something. I got a download, and who knows, is that download can be like a whole blueprint, and just happened in a moment of time, and a spiritual transaction took place. And so what God did is he says, I'm not going to converse with you at your level. He already has been down at our level. Jesus shows us that. Okay. And so he says, I'm going to converse with you. I'm going to raise you up to converse with me at my level. Mm-hmm. And so tongues is the ability to converse with God at God's level. Even though our natural mind, particularly when we're new to tongues, really wrestles against that. And that's because the mind, actually, when the scientists um, did brain brain scans and, and um, begin to see what's going on. The mind actually went inactive. It just went... Mm, because it was bypassed. It wasn't even being used. Yeah. Now, when you're thinking and things like that, they can monitor that. Yeah. When you're speaking in tongues, actually the brain just basically turns off and then it goes, yeah, I'm having enough job here. Wow. Okay, like because that. you're actually conversing in the spirit. Mm-hmm. Don't be bothered when your tongue... No, sorry. Don't be bothered when your mind is trying to scramble what's going on. And just going, it's okay. It doesn't have to know everything. Mm. And in the process of that, ask God for the interpretation of what that tongues was. And then it's like, oh, okay, that's what it is. That's not the time for the brain to engage. Mm. But if you shut yourself down because, well, that sounds really weird, Mm. then you're essentially doubting the thing that God said. And so what I did did for a period of time is I just take my faith and it says... um, Okay, so this is um, 1 Corinthians 42. He that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks unto men, uh, not unto men, but unto God. For no man understands him, howbeit he spe- um, howbeit in the spirit he speaks mysteries. Notice that? Mysteries. In other words, for the grandson, wow, that was that's a bit too deep. But actually, as a son, at the level of the Father, see within the heavenly places, it's fitting. Okay? So... What I would do, I would just say this. He that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks unto God. And I would take that little phrase and by faith, saying, every time I speak in tongues, my spirit's keep speaking unto God. Mm-hmm. And I would remind myself from that. And even though my head was trying to go, way, I said, no, I'm speaking unto God. And in fact, even, even deeper than that, God is speaking unto me. Mm-hmm. And so I just encourage you, tongues are very, very powerful. We don't have time for going into the other gifts. But that's something that you can grab hold of today. Mm. And honestly, I use tongues every day. Mm. And the moment, I'm even in a counseling session or in a moment of inner healing or something like that, and I just, sometimes I just don't know what to do. Mm. And I just say, excuse me, can I have a moment? I'm going to speak in tongues. Mm. So in that place, whoa, hang on a minute. I know what to do now. Now, I don't know where that came from. Well, actually, I do. I know it didn't come from me. Okay? And so tongues leaps us, leaps us past. And all we need to do is this. I've spoken in tongues. I don't really understand what's going on there. What's, it, what's something that I can feel came out of that? And it might be like, mm, I feel we need to, and it might be just very, very small. All I'm carrying, one encounter, is pull on that thread. Oh my gosh! There's a revelation here. Whoa! Okay? If you're trying to look for this big revelation, and, oh no, that seems a bit, a bit too small and significant. You've missed it. Taste that small taste. Pull on it. And the revelation, because that's what faith is, is to believe that that has value. The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed. It is, it's the smallest of the seeds but it grows into the greatest of the herbs. If you're willing to pull on that little seed, I think kingdom's here. Oh my gosh, this is a big tree going on here. Okay? 
So I bless you with that. Let's declare over you in the name of Jesus Christ that you would know gracious favor and the things that have been freely given to your God in Christ Jesus that your eye hasn't seen, your ear hasn't heard, and neither has entered into your heart what God has promised to you who love him, who know to walk in the spirit and not after the flesh in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Cyrus. Awesome. Um, good morning, everyone. You know, just as Cyrus was preaching on the Holy Spirit there, um, Charles asked me to introduce uh, the next speakers who are coming forth, but I, I just thought I'd like to add, you know, something um, that always struck me with the Holy Spirit. Jesus, obviously, said to, and as Cyrus alluded to, he said that um, what I've done you will do and greater. And I mean, if you stop and really think of that statement, I mean, Jesus changed the world upside down and we'll do something greater. It's not about what we do, it's what the Holy Spirit does through us. And if you take Peter, for example, you know, at the time of Jesus' arrest, Peter swore he would go to the cro- uh, die with him just prior. When Jesus was arrested, Jesus prophesied that he would deny him three times. And of course, Peter just thought he's talking crazy talk. But as it came to pass, he did. And uh, he ran away. All the disciples feared for their lives, um, hid, and obviously once Jesus was resurrected and the process of the next 40 days revealing himself to them, um, that same Peter, once Jesus ascended and told them to wait on the Holy Spirit, which came down with tongues of fire upon them all, that same Peter was a changed man who re- spoke a sermon through the Holy Spirit their life. They got 3,000 saved. Now, you know, um, Jesus said, upon you I'll build the church. But the Peter that was denying wasn't changed within himself. The Holy Spirit was the change. And chalk and cheese, really. And, of course, um, Holy Spirit is the key. And uh, if we just surrender to the Holy Spirit, He will have His way. And... Uh, it's just about being susceptible to that and hearing um, hearing the voice of God and knowing that uh, none of us, as Sarah said, none of us are qualified but through the blood of Jesus. Mm-hmm. And uh, if we just let the Holy Spirit control and uh, monitor and, and fill us with everything from not only in the environments like this where we, we're talking Godly talk, so to speak, but even in your daily life, He can help you with your work, your meetings, your complications, your, you know, we've got a, oh, there's a trouble at work, give us, you know, and, and he, He's there, He wants to have every part of your life, not only when we need help. And um, if I could just read you in Acts, it says, Peter's sermon, which I was talking about, you know, it says, in the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Right. Then your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. I will even pour out my spirit on my servants in those days, both men and women, and they will all prophesy. I will display wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and cloud of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. And all those things, the prophesies, the visions and all that, Holy Spirit is the one that dominates all those things in our mind. And we need to learn to put the flesh aside, deny ourselves daily, pick up our cross and follow Him. And through the guidance of that Holy Spirit, it can only be good. I can promise you that. And uh, yeah, I encourage you.